Okay, so I think, uh, hi everyone, I'm Eugene, and this is Linda. We're from the ACC, I recognise some of you, know some of you. And um, today we've put together a, a presentation, um, the logistics perspective of a complex offshore shipping job. So um, I believe last Clinical Governance Day, there was an offshore shipping job that uh, Jill Edwards had spoken about and went into details about the clinical side of it. While this isn't the same case, this is just a logistical side and hopefully uh, you can have a bit of an appreciation for the work that goes on in the background before you guys get tasked to these complex jobs. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the ACC, that's a, a view from the RLTC and you can see all our screens and that. Um, so all our RLTC taskings have some level of complexity. Uh, some are more complex with a lot more moving parts. And uh, the next slide is just to show you that there's a lot of governance around what we do. There's, um, that's not an exhaustive list, but uh, a lot of work instructions, a lot of policy. And as RLTC operators and ACOs, we're supposed to be um, pretty conversant with a lot of this stuff. Um, we have annual currencies based around this, and we have um, code one scenarios, a lot of practice scenarios to make sure that we're all on top of this and that we're doing um, everything safely for you guys out there. So this particular case um, was New Year's Eve. Uh, New Year's Eve just gone. And uh, before I go much further, there are some audio recordings um, related to this case. So a uh, big thank you to those who've agreed to uh, allow the recordings to use to be used. And uh, I just ask that if you do hear anything in there that you may not agree with or may have thought about managing differently, happy to um, talk about that afterwards. So um, historically, there's a, an increased triple, o, triple zero caseload. New Year's Eve just gone, there were over 5,000 um, triple O calls to New South Wales Ambulance. So that has an increased workload for the RLTC operators, a lot more jobs for them to, to go through and scan. Um, usually warmer weather. There's an increase in trauma cases school holidays and another um, layer of com complexity for this particular case was uh, we had an off-site SRC, which um, kind of impacts the room with being able to maintain situational awareness. I guess being an SRC, it's a, a lot easier for you to be able to see what's going on in the room. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to see what the SRC is involved with in the room. We manage it quite well with the remote SRCs. However, it's just to highlight that there's a, another level of um, complexity. The status of the board at the moment, this was the current state of play. It's not too busy at the moment, um, but we've got quite a few assets out and um, then this call comes in. I've been advised for the people who are, are streaming this, you may not hear the audio. If you don't, we're quite happy to send this through uh, for you to listen to afterwards. Is that too loud? So with that phone call coming from someone who's non-clinical to our RLTC, it's very limited information. We need a lot more to, um, we need to dig a lot further to decide whether we're going to even go to this patient. Um, first call was received at 12.12. It's a request to Medivac. 
All we know is that it's an 82-year-old male with a serious condition on a cruise ship and TMAS are involved. For those of you who aren't aware of ANSA, they're the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. They're located in Canberra. They're also um, undertaking the joint rescue coordination um, roles for search and rescue and uh, responsible for maritime safety, protection of the marine environment and maritime aviation search and rescue. They all have a background from aviation or maritime, either ship's captains, uh, crewies, pilots. So um, just highlighting again, uh, it's a non-clinical update for us to request, uh, to request us to move someone off. And for TMAS, Telephone Medical Advisory Services, currently contracted to Lifelight in Queensland, and they provide medical advice to vessels in the Australian search and rescue region. And the next slide is just to highlight how big that region is. So the whole sky blue area that um, circles Australia, all the way across pretty much New Zealand, down to Antarctica, halfway across the Indian Ocean, perpendicular to Sri Lanka and across that. That's the Australian search and rescue area, 10% of the world's ocean. So they provide um, pretty good service to a pretty big area. And you can be confident knowing that um, the consultants at LifeLight are all FASMs. So there's been um, some pretty high level clinical decision making already. But our work instructions are anything for an offshore shipping job goes through TMAS has to be linked to our state retrieval consultant to ensure that an appropriate clinical priority is um, given to it and that it's uh, um, you know timely, it's current, and um, there can be a decision made whether we need to move this patient off the vessel right now. So in the background, RLTC is going to be conducting some more intelligence gathering. This is one of our um, tools that's really helpful. Also from the um, um, Agency for Clinical Innovation, I think it was said before. It's a um, Google map based system. And we can see that we can type in uh, a, a, an address or a Latin long. And depending on what we're looking for with the filter, um, we can find out what our closest uh, air asset is, whether that be um, helo or fixed wing, uh, the approximate travel time that is for the uh, King Airs or for the 139s. It's not live, it doesn't take into consideration headwinds, weather, all that sort of stuff, but it's a really good tool for us to um, determine the most closest resource. Um, we can also um, filter, as you can see, we can see where the closest trauma centre is. Uh, you can see the little blood icon over on the right hand side. Um, can tell us where blood products are. The next slide also shows us. We can also uh, find what clinical services are available, whether it be trauma, radiology, um, even antivenoms. Quite often as RLTC, there'll be someone with a brown snake bite out in whoop whoop and we'll um, coordinate with the control centre to let them know where there's some any venom is. And I think we've even done it for some helos where they've stopped en route to the primary to pick up that any venom uh, ECMO retrieval roster, maternity services. And then it can drill down further and we can see what clinical services are available at those facilities. Over on the right hand side uh, is uh, the blood products that are stored at some of these blood banks. It's not a live database, it's just what their usual um, holdings are but that's just one of our many tools that we can use for our intelligence gathering when tasking an asset or during a mission if anything is needed. So as we said, um, that's the state of play with the status board. RLTC then needs to set up a conference call with TMAS and the state retrieval consultant. And here is that phone call. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. So yeah, RLTC conducting further intelligence collection. They're also maintaining BAU. So as I said before, you know, there were 5,000 unique triple O calls for New South Wales Ambulance last New Year's Eve. Um, for financial year 21-22, the ACC coordinated the transfer of 10,006 patients 
around New South Wales primary and in a facility. And on average, the ACC receives between 22,000 and 26,000 phone calls a month. So it can um, get quite hectic in there and really highlights the importance to be able to maintain your situational awareness. So just uh, mindful of the time. Um, I don't think I need to go into that recording much further. There's a summary of what we've got. And the state retrieval consultant then determines at that point the clinical priority of the case and whether we need to go and extricate that patient off the vessel or whether there's an alternate means of we turn that vessel and the um, patient can remain on board for a um, less riskier operation. So we've got the 81-year-old male with possible ischemic bowel off a cruise ship 140 nautical miles off Coss Harbour. And there's another bit of a um, conflicting bit of information that we've got. The first call that came in from JRCC was, uh, I think it was off the coast of, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, this one says Coffs Harbour. Um, there was another call that said off the coast of Newcastle. So that's going to have a bit of an impact on who we send, when we send them, and um, needs to be dived into a bit further before we task. At this point, when it's been determined that we need to get this patient off, we need to conduct mission oversight. Um, for those of you who don't um, have an awareness of mission oversight, oversimplified, I know, but can we go? Most of the time, um, our um, helo teams can go, fixed wing teams can go, medical teams can go, but it's the should we go. Should um, we go and quite often we'll have someone who's removed from that situation, usually one of the zonies or um, the director, who has a bit of oversight on this can um, make a bit of a, an assessment of a, the risk versus benefit. And they also have oversight of the mission as well as another layer of safety. Um, I've just included the work instruction there for mission oversight and there's a checklist as well that the uh, mission oversight people go through as well as RLTC. Um, after that mission oversight phone call, there was a, a call that was set up between um, the JRCC, the Westpac crew and um, Mission Oversight, but that's not going to um, play for some reason. It's just more to highlight that this can take time. There's a lot of work going on in the background. You're seeing this job that's in CAD and um, seeing the time tick, not necessarily this one, but some of the other primaries that are a bit more complex. Some of the challenges that we can experience with any case, but um, can sort of be highlighted with this one as well. Oops. Um, the conflicting information, as I said before, one report was Newcastle, one report was Coffs Harbour. We've received a non-clinical referral. The initial call was serious condition. We all know that that ranges. Uh, comms issues, a lot of the time um, we're talking to these vessels offshore, there's sat phones, there's delays, um, the helo sat phones, delays, and a lot of the um, vessels might have uh, captains from non-English speaking backgrounds as well, and also limited clinical knowledge, especially on these uh, tankers and the uh, cargo ships that we have. We have, um, um, they, do, they don't have any medical people on them at all. On the cruise ship, there's usually at least a, a doctor. Uh, the vessels experience with winch operations, how, how recent they're um, Winch experience is vessel size, weather, sea state, and nighttime operations as well all add to the risk. And the reason why we also ensure that uh, these calls go through the ACC, um, obviously, so that we have awareness and involvement, but it's all recorded as well. Um, command and control for these jobs, it's pretty straightforward for offshore shipping jobs. Uh, the control uh, remains with the ACC and the command of the incident rests with the relevant zone manager. Uh, for your onshore um, complex jobs or onshore jobs where there's command and control, uh, it's the com control is um, handed over to your uh, control centre and the relevant duty superintendent will have um, command of the incident. But Sometimes, even though you're handed over to the control centre, part of the mission oversight and part of um, that uh, mission following, we get asked to ensure these other aspects are implemented to make sure that the mission safe safe forward commander 
duty superintendent's been notified that there's a road ambulance response. Obviously, you can't do that for an offshore shipping job, a lot of these. That there's a staging point, what other agencies are going, and the salt line activation. For your offshore shipping jobs, um, top cover is provided by AMSA as well. They have um, Challenger jets located in Perth, Melbourne and Cairns. For us, they usually get deployed from Cairns or Melbourne. Um, they can deploy life-sustaining stores, uh, life-sustaining stores, and they can also act as a comms relay for your over-the-horizon communications as well when you're out um, at sea. If uh, the jet Challenger jet isn't available, the military can also um, step in. So it's not a set and forget approach. Once uh, you guys have been tasked, or the, the Hilo teams have been tasked, um, there's a lot of things that RLTC need to do until you guys, until the team are back at um, base. And these include um, flight tracking, uh, updates to and from the stakeholders, updates at critical mission points, as, uh, sorry, critical mission point updates. That's either via radio, CAD, telephone teams. It's just a, a couple of um, means that we communicate through. We need to maintain our ACC situational awareness. We need to be conversant with code one procedures as well too for um, aircraft in distress. So the last slide um, is just some stats related to this case. Uh, the first call was at 12.12 and the helo got tasked at 13.59. Um, the helo launched at 15.20, bit of a delay there because uh, that was um, in line with getting the top cover to scene at the same time as a helicopter and uh, returned to base at 18.12. So the mission time for the um, helicopter team was two hours and 52 minutes. However, for the ACC, we had 22 um, phone calls related to this specific case, all interagency coordination, JRCC, TMAS, et cetera, conducting mission oversight, flight tracking, updates to and from the stakeholders, critical mission point updates. And so the total case time for RLTC was six hours. So that kind of just tries to highlight the work that goes in to these complex jobs um, behind the scenes to help them run smoothly. Any questions? That's it. Thank you.